be here now. Just be here now. Hey everyone, it's Raghu back with Mind Rolling and my long, long time friend, Ram Dev, known as Dale Borglum. Hey, great to see you again. This is our opportunity to hang out, really. Hey, Raghu, it's like the only time I see you is when we're doing the podcast. Well, you know, it has been the pandemic. You live a little ways away. I, uh, but no, uh, I, yeah. I'm not complaining. Hopefully I can come down to Ohio yeah. and visit sometime. Yeah, things are getting better, too. So uh, I, before we got on here, uh, Ramdev Dale said to me, "Well, what the, what are we talking about? What what is what is this? We just we do a podcast." And I said, "Oh yeah, no, we'll wing it. It'll be okay." So everybody out there, this is winging time. Maybe I could start with a Maharaji story. Perfect. That would be a complete segue into into winging it. So. We had just gotten to Maharaji, and somehow Mohan and I were with Maharaji, the only Westerners, so all these Indian people there, and Mohan and me, and Maharaji was talking to the Indians in Pahari or Hindi or whatever he was talking in, right? I, we didn't know what he was talking about, and he turned to us and he said, how much do you pay for milk in America? And Mohan does some quick calculating in his head, and he says, X rupees per kilo, which is, you know, the way they buy milk in India. And Maharaji feigns excitement. He says, oh, my goodness, they pay so much money. And he turns to the Indian people and he starts talking to them for like five or ten minutes. And I'm thinking, now, wait a minute. I've come all the way from India. I just got my PhD. I'm sorry, from America to (laughs) India. I just got my PhD. I'm a smart guy. And we're talking about the price of milk. I mean, I wanted to find God. And we're talking about milk. Maybe he's not who Ramdas said he was. Like, this is right in the very beginning, right? I didn't quite know yet. So he turns back to us and he says, how much was it again? And Mohan tells it again, how, how much it costs for milk. And he goes on and on to these Indian people about the price of milk in America. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. You know, this is, this is not what I signed up for. <laughs> and all of a sudden, there was an explosion in my mind that I knew came from him. And he said... We can talk about important things, but that just makes the mind busy. If we're just talking about all this bullshit, we can rest in this ocean of bliss. And I went into this bliss state. I could barely talk for the rest of the day. Mm. <laughs> right? mm. So, oh. you know, you and I do these podcast, podcasts and we try to get really interesting stuff. <laughs> but in some way, you know, people are taking their notes and getting all busy collecting the wisdom. And maybe there's at least as much love, if not more, available. And we're talking about the Giants and Dodgers playoff game or something like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Well, when you say when you first got, you had just gotten there and I, where we met, and we haven't talked about this, and if we did, it was a long time ago, was at Swami Muktananda's ashram in Ganesh Puri, where you and uh, Kyle, Kyle, were uh, waving big, big peacock or ostrich feathers, something, peacock feathers. Probably, peacock feathers. Right? Yeah, and as part of this whole installation of uh, Swami Muktananda's guru, Nityananda, who was quite a bit like Neem Karoli Baba, apparently. Um, I actually met him once in, in a dream, and uh, yeah, there was a lot of... Similarity there for sure. And I looked at you guys and I went, oh my God. You know, I knew they'd been here in India for a while. They were gaunt. Bones, because they were, uh, they were just had a, a, a lungi, a sarong or something around them. They were bare chested because that was part of the deal. You had to be with waving these things. You know, that was their job. And the level of... I, this is probably not uh, appropriate. You know how much is not appropriate to say these days, from there. <laughs> I do. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to try, but the, I mean, and I'll apologize before if it's if it really is. But 
I just thought to myself, these guys, look, they just came from a concentration camp. My God, I've never seen that kind of gaunt uh, physique. So uh, that's how we met. And every, and when they and when you guys came up to Kenshi and we saw you up there, it was like, I'm talking really the whole. I don't know what were you doing and you were not eating. I don't get what was going on. I will explain. So uh, I was living in Palo Alto, going to Stanford, and when Ramdas would come to Palo uh, Northern California, he'd stay at the home of this guy Joel Waldman, who he had been with at. Millbrook after they got kicked out of Harvard. So I was friends with Joel and I got to be drinking buddies with Ramdas when I was in graduate school. And Ramdas was about to go back to India for the second time. Uh, the first time he had been with Maharaji, but mostly with Haridas. And his life had been transformed. He was going around the country talking about Maharaji, but feeling that Maharaji was a secret, that he couldn't tell everybody to come because only Bhagwandas and Ramdas and this English couple and maybe one or two other people among Westerners had ever found Maharaji at this point. So Ramdas is feeling pretty guilty because he's turned everybody on, oh, Maharaji is so great, but sorry, you can't come to see him, right? And he's about <laughs> to go back to India and Hilda Charlton, this wonderful meditation teacher from New York, calls him up. And says, Ramdas, there's this wonderful yogi. He's just come to New York. You've got to come and see him. It was Swami Muktananda. Nobody had ever heard of Swami Muktananda. So Ramdas comes there, and his initial take was that Swami Muktananda was the same being as Maharaji. And I may get in trouble for saying this, but that is an opinion he greatly shifted later on. Right? Okay. <laughs> That's a wild understatement, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So... Ramdas has this feeling if, hey, if, if I'm the, the front man, the opening act for Muktananda on his North American tour, all these people will become because everybody knows me and hardly anybody knows Swami Muktananda. And then I can turn everybody on to Muktananda and I don't have to feel guilty about going back to Maharaji. So he's the, he's the opening <laughs> act and he's going across America and he calls up me and this guy, Joel, and says, would you... Uh, organized the Northern California part of Swami Muktananda's tour. We said, sure, we would do it. It turned out to be much more difficult than we expected. Swami Muktananda expected to be treated like a king with thrones and, and bushels of flowers, <laughs> the whole thing. Joel had a nervous breakdown. He couldn't take it. <laughs> and Kyle McGee, Cow, as you described him, took over. So Kyle was getting his bachelor's degree the same time I was getting my PhD, and we organized the whole Muktananda thing. And then Ram Dass and Muktananda went off to Australia and then to India, down to uh, Satya Sai Baba's place. And uh, Kyle and I ended up going to India uh, separately. And uh, I had been in Berkeley and Stanford for 10 years studying math, and I came to India. The first day in India was... It was holy. You toss that off like it's a nothing. Ten years well, uh, studying yeah. math, statistics. Just listen to <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, but what I'm saying is my mind was a complete total wreck, right? <laughs> so I, I come flying into India, and it's the holiday holy. I didn't know it was a holiday. Everybody was crazy. They're throwing colored powder and water balloons at each other, and everybody's intoxicated. I thought, this, this is the craziest place I've ever been. Mm -hmm. And... I really needed. I really felt I needed to go somewhere to calm down after all of this math and all of this craziness of California and psychedelics and all that stuff. And we were only about like a four hours bus train ride from Muktananda's place in Ganeshpuri. So I decided I would go there just to just to chill. And I went there being a healthy human being when I started. And Muktananda had, would say things like, you're having this chance to be with the Satguru. Do not eat too much. Don't waste your energy uh, digesting. Take all your energy and, and send it toward God, right? Put it into your practice. And uh, I'll probably offend a few people, but my direct perception was that being at Ganeshpuri was a cross between... In, uh, 
a concentration camp, an insane asylum, and an ashram. I was right then. <laughs> <laughs> you were. I'd be walking down the hall, and the guy in front of me would go into Shakti Pot, and he'd start bouncing off the wall, right? And they fed you very little. And then monsoon came, and my, did, my digestive fire went out, and I, I ended up weighing 113 pounds. I had blood Jeez. coming out of my asshole, oh, my, my feet. My, you know, it was like I couldn't even digest food anymore. And in, in Ganeshpuri, if either you were well enough to work in the fields or you were sick enough to, to leave the ashram and go into Bombay, as it was called in those days, and go to this Catholic hospital, there was not one mirror in the ashram, right? And I finally got so weak that I had to rest partway going up a flight of stairs. Oh <laughs> so I decided I'd go to this hospital. But in the meantime, Muktananda had commissioned this big stone murti of his guru, Nityananda. I felt the, the connection with Nityananda, not so much Muktananda. And for some reason, of the three people that he picked to be the pujaris, <laughs> Two of them were Maharaji people. It was me and it, me and, and Kyle wow. Vishu who were doing the, the whole thing. And it even got more dramatic because when they consecrated the statue, the Shankaracharya of all of India came. He's like the Pope, right, of one yeah, whole yeah. big sect of yeah. Hinduism. And Rudy, Swami Rudrananda came from New York and mm -hmm. Ramdas was there. And Swami Rudrananda was the chief... Western disciple of, of Muktananda. And we, but yet Muktananda was starting to favor Ramdas in a certain way. And the day of the big consecration, Rudy said to some people, I'm going to take a little nap, wake me up in time for the, the thing, right? And they didn't wake him up. He missed the whole thing. Muktananda put Ramdas on the throne up right next to him. And Rudy left in a, in a rage and never came back. <laughs> so it's a lot of drama there. Anyhow, I was there. I saw that every piece of what you're saying, every moment I saw. And we were, and the Maharaji people, me and uh, Krishna Das and Ramesh and Dwarka, were sleeping on Baba Shetty's uh, rooftop over at yeah. that house down the way. And uh, and that's my my when I first saw him, I was like everybody was bowing down. So. I did what, you know, when you're in Rome. And then it just didn't, I couldn't get any kind of feeling of, of anything spiritual, never mind devotional. Right. And then Ram Dass came the next day and I said, look, I can't get anywhere near what, I don't know what this is. And he said, well, you know, it's a good way to look at yourself, you know, see where you're stuck. This is just, you know, the spirit honoring the spirit in another being. And I said, okay. And they went back the next day. And this is when he told me where to go to meet Maharaji. And I did the same thing and nothing, same kind of total, absolutely uh, conditional and uh, talk about polarization inside. I mean, you know, I was having a whole storm about it inside. It was all this conditionality, but... Uh, and the one thing he did is he helped me fly up to Nainital like two days later. I mean, whatever path I took, trains and you know buses and all that, it worked perfectly. So I felt like he helped out there. And just to say, I mean, we both have the same thing. We're sort of backtracking now. But yes, I also, and I said it, that I had met Nityananda in a dream the night before I was going to Ganesh Puri to meet Swami Muktananda, and uh, it was an extraordinary thing that I can remember in this moment. And so I always felt connected there and then heard all the stories. I went to where his ashram was and, you know, we went and went into all of his rooms. It was a really powerful experience. But Swami Muktananda was a very powerful yogi and had tremendous shakti, meaning you know, uh, spiritual energy, shall we say, or just energy. And the people bouncing off the walls were experiencing this. They were like just, uh, they were s just sucking it up. 
every little bit of it. That, you know, the Westerners, we got to do something here. We're going to get somewhere and we're going to get this Shakti and we're going to hop up and down for a while and then we're going to go into bliss. And a lot of that was happening and, and he had that energy. He had a meditation cave below his rooms and that was extraordinary. I mean, it's completely dark. It was an extraordinary experience, really. Yeah. So, and Ramdas went through, you know, some very specifically went in th- through all of these incredible astral planes on a trip that was kind of designed by Swami Muktananda. So, let's say that he he was he was definitely the real thing, and the Shakti was was real as well. And uh, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. When you say he was the real thing, uh, I'm not he, qualifying the real thing. Okay. Okay, it's like a saint. There's 14,000 billion saints in India. Okay. It's like that. That's that's kind so of So he he about. clearly had a lot of wisdom, he had a lot of shakti. But yeah. I never felt any connection with him at all. I didn't yeah. feel the slightest bit of warmth. You know, yeah. I needed to be there as kind of like boot camp so my mind would yeah. get destroyed so I could go to Maharaji yeah. and not be a complete nut. Yeah, well, and almost die in the process. You, yeah, you, almost you got die some in the process. Rough treatment over there. <laughs> uh, so, anyhow, uh, okay. So now we're winging it, and uh, but uh, as you well know, it is the fiftieth anniversary of that publication of Ramdas's book. Be here now. Actually, I believe it is. It, if it's not today, somebody actually looked it up. It's October ten. 11, 12, 13, like that, actually. Wow. So here we are. Lucky Uh, us. Yeah. So, uh, but I, you know, since we're doing a big celebration at the Wisdom Theater, by the time you hear this, probably it will have um, been completed and and honoring Ramdas and celebrating the book. And I've had to think a lot about be here now. And mostly it's, it's almost like, yeah. uh, uh, we found out that a, an insurance company owned the trademark to that phrase. How about that? Before he wrote the book, they owned it or after? No, after they must, they trademarked it at some point, but forgot about it. In other words, they didn't really give a shit about it. They never, they may have used it in a campaign or some crazy thing. So we, uh, it led us to you know, get get it back. And uh, so, uh, but that's just the aphorism, you know, be here now. Yeah, it's very cool. Oh, yeah, that book. Oh, that guy. Yeah, Richard Alpert, Ram Dass. You know, it's like that. <laughs> so I started to think, well, wait a minute. And I was talking about this on something we were doing. Getting present through not following your mind into the future or into the past is a powerful practice and that when it and this all you know you'll you'll say your experience but mine is that when that does happen and you're settled in in a moment any moment and then naturally to me there's a there's a presence that accompanies being in that moment being uh, not chasing shit you know, chasing thoughts forward, past, whatever it may be, a presence starts to happen. So to me, it's, it's, a, it's a profound thing that once it starts to happen, and if it, if it, you know, as Rinpoche used to talk about, the gap in meditation, and if that gap enlargens that moment, the presence, mm-hmm. so does the presence of whatever you want to call it. I mean, with, there's so many names for it. Is that uh, something you... Uh, can relate with yeah i uh, to me it's a little more complicated than that uh i, I guess well I you're like a to... <laughs> you're a scientist okay i'm just a <laughs> schlepper that's making well, his I'm, way i'm kind of a meditation teacher and maharaji kind of told me to be a meditation teacher mm. at one point actually yeah. so i mean to me be here now in the beginning is just like vipassana meditation you're mindful here you are and as practice deepens, I mean, you've spent 50 years with Maharaji, right, uh, in your heart. You've, you've done a lot of practice. So that be here now goes through different stages of deepening from just uh, embodied mindfulness 
And then one brings in the heart. You're being here now with an open heart. You're having compassion for suffering. You're having devotion for God. And that moves then into the tantric stage. Maharaji was essentially a tantric teacher in a lot of ways where be here now. So in the beginning, be here now is you're aware of the content. You're being with the content. And as you're more aware of the content, then the mind begins to relax uh, and you're not trying to avoid suffering all the time. And the heart begins to open. Now you're more being here now in relationship to the content. This is a loving relationship. And as that deepens and the eye fixation isn't right in your face all the time, the, the sacred nature of everything. Maharaji says the best form to worship God is every form. It's all sacred. All rivers are the Ganges. All mountains are Kailash, etc. So that at a certain level, be here now is being with the sacred nature, beyond pure and impure, right? So that uh, the be here now is different things to different people, depending on the depth of your practice at a certain point. That's what I said. Yeah, you, it is. The present <laughs> happens, and then the deepening into the presence. Presence, loving, a divine presence, loving, awareness, whatever. Okay, but what I'm saying, Rog, was that a lot of people are, are being here now, and it they're not feeling presence. They're 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 being with their breath, they're being with their thoughts, they're being with their sensations. Well, they're Buddhists, and you know. Yeah, well, that's yeah. their problem. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're we're just getting everybody today. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm going to hear about it. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm kidding. I mean, Buddhism is a completely wonderful path, but they don't talk about presence. No. P, P R with a with a capital P. Yeah. It's uh, so, or maybe they do some in Tibetan Buddhism. Tibet, the with, Tibetan Buddhist with yeah. Rigpa, with the, but certainly in Vipassana and in, and in Zen, mm -hmm. we're not talking about presence. We're talking about the spacious nature of heart of dissolving into the boundless empty heart where you're you're not really talking about presence so your be here now comes from a much more devotional path where when the mind gets out of the way maharaji is revealed god is revealed the sacred nature of all exactly. stuff is revealed i mean yes. even like shiva and kali and and like covid and, and republicanism trump thing and the uh, let's see how many people we can offend in one half hour here, right? <laughs> that, that all the dark as well as all the light is 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 the sacred. Yeah. yeah. War and COVID and divorce and cancer. Yeah. That's good. I like it. Yeah. Presence. Which, yeah, presence. Present and presence and... Uh, Ramdas, uh, I just did something with somebody, and this is an interesting. I said really that so mindfulness, uh, uh, in terms of actually actuating what Ramdev is talking about, or myself, is practice. There's no way you're just going to wish yourself into oh, moment is nice, you know, and <laughs> it's bullshit. <laughs> it's spiritual bypass 101. Um, so practice is important, and then that and uh, Ramdev is talking about meditation, and uh, he teaches meditation, and at the same time, mindfulness is extraordinarily important in my mind. And I was telling this person they were doing some story about Ramdas that Ramdas to me was the first, well, the first person I knew who even talked about something a perspective from which you can see all of those selfish motivations, all of the judging, all of the stuff, and he would call it the witness. Mm -hmm. And just let me read this thing, because actually it's pretty good. The technique of the witness is to merely sit with the fear and be aware of it before it becomes so consuming that there's no space left. Mm -hmm. The image I usually use is that of a picture frame and a painting of a gray cloud against a blue sky, but the picture frame is a little too small. So you bend the canvas around to frame it, but in doing so, you lost all the blue sky. So you end up with just a framed gray cloud. It fills the entire frame. So when you say, I'm afraid or I'm depressed, 
if you enlarge the frame so that just a little blue space shows, you would say, ah, a cloud. That is what the witness is. The right. witness is that tiny little blue over in the corner that leads you to say, ah, fear. So he, he really brought that in when he first came back from India. That was a big deal you know, in mm -hmm. terms of helping people deal with, uh, with all the mind stuff. Right. And, and then it leads to, um, you know, talking really, our, some of our best friends are Buddhists. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it leads us to awareness. <laughs> awareness. Oh, God. Ramdev, I, we're, this is, we're just chatting, folks, but we're doing this film on K.C. Tuari, our mentor from the, our days in India, who was a, a very high yogi, but nobody knew anything about him, and which is why we're doing the film. And there's one point, I, I, I remember him. I don't know if he did it to you, but he used to come up to me awareness my boy awareness he'd repeat it as a mantra and then he'd take he'd go up to my side of my uh forehead uh face and he'd he, you need some help and he'd like screw the screw was a little loose he thought and he screwed it back in and said if you think you're doing it you are lost my boy <laughs> <laughs> So awareness, right? So uh, here's something else from Ramdas. When Buddhists talk about the preciousness of a human birth, it's the awareness associated with human birth that's the opportunity. We become aware to bring ourselves to higher consciousness. Suffering is part of it too. It's all grist for the mill of developing awareness. What's here in front of you is what you can be aware of. It's food for enlightenment. It's your part in this passing show of life, Ramdas. That's a pretty good quote, but yeah, you want to, from your point of view, preciousness of human birth and, and the awareness that's associated with this and the opportunity. Can I go back to the fear thing a little bit? So mm. uh, in English, we say, I am afraid. In Spanish, the translation is, I have fear. In Tibetan, they say, fear is here. <laughs> yeah, so that thinking and speaking in English, it's much harder to be a witness. We tend to identify with, I am the passing cloud, right? And yeah. the, the cloud, the cloud is actually moving. It's going to be gone if you, if you just let it move. And those quotes you brought out really uh, speak very eloquently to Ramdas promoting awareness. Mm -hmm. But he, he, he also said another thing. When, when we were in India, he had the slogan, faith, common, no fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fear, common, no faith. Yeah, yeah. So that the way I look at it, there are, there are really two ways to deal with fear. One of them is to do just what you're talking about, what he was talking about, being, being aware of the fear. Uh, and by being aware of it, it will gradually uh, diminish. But the other way is increasing the faith. So you can either drop the fear down or you can raise the faith up, right? And both, both, right? Both. Or, or both. both uh, it's got it both in my mind. But when we were with, with, with Maharaji, he didn't really, uh, in my view, maybe you can have a different opinion here, but in my view, he didn't really much promote meditation. I mean, my mind was such a mess, and I heard Goenka was going to be doing this thing in Bodh Gaya, four courses. So I said, hey, can I go to study with Goenka, can I do Buddhist meditation? And he said, if you wish. <laughs> he, wasn't, he, wasn't, he was kind of th saying, why would you want to leave me and go with uh, uh, that thing? I, I don't know. I mean, that was my take on what he said. And when people meditated around him, he'd throw fruit at them or he'd pull their beard or something like that. And uh, it, was, it was a lot more about surrender and devotion and just love, serve, remember, right? Uh, and as we've left him, and there's not there's not the, that uh, immediate satsang at his feet kind of thing that people have gone off into Tibetan Buddhism and Zen Buddhism and Christianity and Hinduism and various forms. But I mean, to me, at the heart of my being here now is not my breath, but Maharaji. Right? It's like I remember once I was I was at these meditation retreats in Bodh Gaya. 
And I, between two of them, I had to go and cash a traveler's check at some Indian bank, which you may remember a rural mm -hmm. bank is not what you think it is, you know? So you go in there and I'm sitting on a bench for two or three hours. Well, the guy who could do something in three minutes, is just too busy to, I mean, he's not too busy. He's just kind of ignoring me. Right. So yeah, right. I'm sitting there and another guy from the course comes down and he sits down next to me. And, and I said, hi, how are you doing? What are you doing? He said, well, I'm just watching my breath. Aren't you? And I was so fascinated with being in an Indian bank and all the people and all the stuff. I, I realized that I was not a Buddhist in the way this guy was a Buddhist. I, mean, I was <laughs> into, hey, this is India. Let's 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 trip here. Let's let's see what's going on, mm. right? And that it's more like there's Maharaj in that weird form, and there he is in that wonderful form. Uh, uh, that it, it's all got it. Like Mother Teresa said when she would take a beggar out of the gutter in Calcutta that she would see Christ in his distressing disguise. Mm. And to me, that's much more being with the mantra and seeing it everywhere is my way of being here now much more than trying to be mindful of breath or mindful of uh, thoughts as I'm like on the podcast with you or I'm driving my automobile or I'm cooking my dinner or whatever it might be. Mm. I do believe, I mean, when you say Maharaji kind of laughed at you for even asking s such a thing that's your projection sure too yeah uh, for, be, sure, for sure <laughs> because uh to say that yeah what are you doing you crazy when you just stay here to me nothing none none of that was going on nothing like that to me because i had the same experience about hey should we go there or he might have even said Oh, why don't you go to the, going to the, no, he said, are you going to the course? In English, he'd go, course. And, you know, we, off, off we'd go, you know. It was actually Parvati and I, we were together at that time. And then when we came back, the few of us that had gone, he said, oh, you know how to meditate now. And we go, yeah. <laughs> he said, well, show me. And he's sitting there with a bunch of Indian people. And we all sat up real straight and meditated. Right? <laughs> right. Within th four seconds, there was these high peals of laughter from him and everybody else around him. <laughs> and he went, look, they know how to meditate. <laughs> so there was that level of ridiculousness of all of it, which is what you're really saying. I mean, right, right, right. And at the same time, personally, that has been a, a that practice has been a rudder in 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 no uncertain terms for me. Um, yeah, main practice may be is kirtan and so on, but that is a rudder on a day to day basis. And I believe that for all of us that took those courses back then, it was extremely um, well planned. For all of us. I, I am not disagreeing. I'm forever grateful to have uh, been with Goenka and Winendra and Suzuki Roshi and all the Tibetan yeah. people I've been with. But in a way, it's created a foundation for the devotion. Yeah. In the, yep. Exactly. Exactly you know, that. Exactly. And that, and that for everybody, and this hasn't, let's take it out of our little bubble with Neem Karoli Baba and, and the reality uh, of... Um, Let's use another term for devotion. That's devotion is a tough word, aren't you? I mean, are you spouting around devotion a lot these days to people? I like to call it. Uh, just, yeah, I am actually. You are. Oh my God! This I is use a big change. God word all the time with Buddhists. really oh, God yeah, it's too. Wonderful. God, God devotion. Yeah, awful. Um, I would say though, I like to use divine presence. I just like it. It's just a. It's more simple, and, and, and it encompasses both devotion, just in the way, you know, divine presence, just in the way you even say it. So it encompasses that, and it encompasses the ineffable thingy uh, uh, that we call God. Some people call God or Buddha mind, they call it the Buddhists and so on. Whatever it is, there's only one thing going on, and we all have different names for it. Right. But so I I do like so everybody you know in terms of the the what we're talking about which is uh, if we just talk about divine presence and what it represents is becoming 
free of the me, me to some degree. We're not asking for full-on losing uh, subject object. That That's out of our price range right now, probably. But we are... Yeah. <laughs> okay, you... You're, I, uh, you absolutely, I, I'm, I'm, occasionally. I'll keep you out of it, yeah, and it's occasionally too. So, uh, but it is possible to, to me, to, to be receptive the way that, like Ramdas said, psychedelics, the experience of psychedelics allowed me to really grok Neem Karoli Baba way more than I would have if I had not understood yeah. because I was, I was out, of, it's out of rational mind. Right. And that's what happens. And in the same way, w we can have that experience mm -hmm. and it can be fueled by Vipassana meditation and mindfulness practices. And uh, at the same time, there, there is the heart to attend to for sure, which is why Ramdas in the end in the last number of years, was so very specific about and over and over and over, loving awareness, mm -hmm. loving awareness. Bringing the two no together. Judgment. Yeah, exactly. So when I talk about devotion, or I use the word God, it's not like some guy with a beard up in, up in the sky. It, it, is, it is presence. It, it, it is divine presence. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the view of Tantra uh, Tibetan Tantra, Buddhist Tantra, ancient Hindu Tantra is that that there is one consciousness that flows through us individual filters that's creating reality and that there is not an objective reality out there that we're perceiving. That it's it's instead of us being individual receiving devices through our sense organs, we're creating reality. And quantum mechanics has math mathematically proven recently that that is actually the case. Hmm. So that the Western worldview upon which the medical model is based is backwards, really, in a certain way. And if my leg gets broken, I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm not saying that. But it's, it's, it, it's all consciousness. It's all God. It's all divine presence. And for me, just given my personality, I'm not laying this on you or anybody else, that the path, the, the, the path to that understanding is through the heart. And the heart, for the heart to stay open when the environment is not being supportive requires a great deal of mindfulness and embodied awareness and stuff like that so that when somebody gets mad at you or the bank account drops down or the weather gets bad, you, you are stable enough that the heart can stay open, that you don't need the environment to be super supportive yeah. to, to remain loving. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I remember back in the day with, when uh, I was beginning all this stuff, Hare Krishna people were like so loving, right? But they didn't have that mindfulness component to it, right? And as I got to know those people, as loving as they were, there was a kind of an ungrounded, uncentered, etheric quality that didn't really serve too many of them well in terms of going out into the world. And there are a lot of Buddhists who get really dry and, and kind of brittle after they've meditated for five decades or something like that, right? So it, it's really finding some balance. And the problem is that very few of us have a teacher who says you need more to open your heart and now you need to get a divorce and now you need to become a vegetarian and now you need to eat a bunch of hamburgers, right? And, and kind of guide, guide one through the, the, the confusing path that we call the spiritual path so that we, we've got to be figuring that out ourselves. I think, though, that we can take little guy steps more <laughs> Baby steps instead of uh, too much focusing on that, the big bigness of uh, it's like that thing with Ramdas with that tiny little speck of awareness, right? If you just enlarge and the you know make the picture larger, and then that little you see the little possibility there, and that see that possibility is really through trust in my mind. You start to trust the experiences that you have where you're not lost, where you're not um, clinging the way that we cling on a day-to-day -day basis. And then you have enough 
desire comes from somewhere, the wisdom of intent, shall we say, allows you to focus more there than on um, just continuing the habitual patterns and neurotic tendencies because after a while you just get so sick of it. Yeah. You really want to enlarge in that little, little patch of blue sky of awareness, right? And uh, I, I think the, the baby steps are definitely, uh, there's, uh, I mean, the, the Buddha himself said, Sangha. I think if people started thinking of get, you know, now of course we can get together a little bit more if it or we've been doing stuff online that you've been part of, and uh, if we we start there and everybody gets a feeling we're all in this together, it'll go a long way to cutting through all the way to cutting through some of the polarity, both ar uh, around people that we are so obviously in disagreement with. But let's just start with ourselves. The polarity, I, I talked to this monk, uh, the polarity inside ourselves is very strong and to me reflects everything that's obviously outside ourselves. Mm. I had the, a monk on from, uh, he was a monk with Thich Nhat Hanh for many, many years and a uh, beautiful man. And he wrote this book and in it he, uh, well, we did a podcast together. He said, I was the perfect monk. I was going to be the perfect meditator and do everything prescribed exactly and he said nothing happened for 20 years so i finally got sick of it and then i i left the monk being a monk and got married as soon as that happened boom started to have real absorption into states beyond polarity and so um yeah, when we put a lot of pressure on trying to get where we think we need to go, uh, I think that just creates uh, even more uh, obstacles for ourselves. And that's why I say baby steps, which include meditation, which include mindfulness, which include, in in our in my case, uh, certainly chanting as as a path. And in, but if you start with satsang, which uh, Thich Nhat Hanh himself said the next, the coming Maitreya is the Sangha. And I think that's super, super important uh, and something that we actively pursue within the stuff that we're doing with the Love, Serve, Remember Foundation. Couldn't agree more. Um, by the way, did you know, in terms of mindfulness, do you know that it actually, this I got it in, uh, from Bob Thurman, Maybe you already know this. I didn't know it. It means like the San Sanskrit term is smriti, and the it, the English mindfulness comes from that term smriti, and in Pali it's sati, mm -hmm. and it means memory. I didn't know that. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? But Bob knows everything, so let's yeah, believe no. him. Oh, no, we absolutely. Bob is, is, <laughs> a, is a guru for sure. Um, <laughs> um, so what, uh, in fact, uh, by the way, everybody out there, I did a, a, Bob has a new book. I'm pushing Bob's new book, Wisdom is Bliss. It's four friendly fun facts that can change your life. He just turns the whole thing into such a, a beautiful planes, this interpreting the four noble truths, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so he taught just to talk about that. Usually, our constant stream of remembering. I mean, this is an important thing. Actually, gets stuck in the past as we go into reveries in our memories of what happened to us at this or that time, and the same type of mental scattering occurs in anticipating things. This is all about be here now. Uh, where we imagine things that might happen in the future. We quote-unquote remember the future. That's cool. When we take focus away from remembering the past and anticipating the future, we can quote-unquote remember to be more and more aware and mindful of what is going on in the presence. When we do this, indeed, we, we can gradually become lucidly aware. How cool is that? That's a great thing. It's super cool. Yeah. 
So that in Tibetan Buddhism, traditionally, there is a great deal of emphasis placed on developing mindfulness in the beginning uh, mm -hmm. and, and compassion before these tantric stages. I mean, people do a million mantras and a hundred thousand full prostrations and do all these purification practices to be able to inhabit their body, to, mm. to, to go beyond automatic reactivity, to become aware. And after a long time of doing those practices, then, then you go in and see the Lama and he bops or she bops you on the head and gives you the empowerment to be Tara or Chinrezi or whoever it is. Right. But, but the, the tantric stage, the stage of true devotion, of tantric devotion, only happens after exactly what you're talking about here. Mm. This is so crazy because you're, you're like, like years ago, I think, years ago, <laughs> it would have been a little bit of a different twist. I mean, all now you're like Mr. Devotion. It's incredible. You used to be Mr. Statistical Buddhist Mind Person. Well, that's maybe what I showed you when you saw. The other was always lurking there, I <laughs> it was, assure you. Yeah, it's lurking in all of us. <laughs> that's the point, actually. That is the point. It is lurking in all of us, no matter what. You know, whatever my projection of Dale Borglum-ness right, from 20 endless. years ago, 30 years ago, whatever, uh, and my own projections of my own story, lurking beneath all of that is that wonderful, absolutely free, which is what the Advaita say. You're just, right. you're there. You just stop, stop all this stuff, uh, which is true. And yet this is a whole other uh, very... We, we shouldn't go in because then we'll be denigrating the Advaitists and then we'll have... Well, we'll cover them all <laughs> in one fell swoop. You know, that's good. So, so... When I got to Maharaji, my mind was just this wreck from all the mathematics. And I came to him and said, how should I meditate, Maharaji? And I thought he'd say something like, think of me and concentrate on your third eye or something. Did you actually, sorry to interrupt you. Did you actually say those words? Is it yeah. in your diary? How can I meditate? Did yeah, how should that? I meditate? I don't how know what I the meditate? translator said to him, but that's what yeah. I said to the translator. Yeah. And Maharaji said, he said, remember Mariam. I said, what? <laughs> he, said, he said, remember Mary, the mother of Jesus. See all women as the mother and you'll be able to meditate. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then when I was about to go back to America, I said, hey, I used to be a scientist, but I don't think I want to be a scientist anymore. What should I do when I go back to America? He said, just keep saying the mantra I gave you. <laughs> so he kept encouraging me to... He also gave me some instruction about meditation, but his 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 the, the the basic stuff he was pushing me into was beginning to to soften the heart. I mean, you know, I had this mind from all the math, and I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but my work still is getting out of the mind and into the heart. And in uh, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, they talk about dropping the mind into the heart, letting mm -hmm. the mind be flavored by the the nectar of the heart all the time if you will and uh i was going to say something else but i forgot it because my brain is getting too old but so that's okay yeah you're allowed but uh, what i wanted to say to you uh was and you know this i think but the, it's it's uh, i said the exact same thing to maharaji how do i meditate Exact same thing. Now, I, I didn't uh, I'm probably, uh, I think I've heard this story before, a long time back, uh, what he said to you. I never thought, though, that we actually said the same exact question. You know, can I have a mantra is, is could have been what I said. That's what I was thinking. I wasn't asking about me. I don't know why it came out like that. That's what I wanted. Just give me a mantra. Let me go home. I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, so I said, better than, he said, Meditate like Christ when he was nailed to the cross. He felt no pain. He was lost in love with every being. Right. And I, I'm like, wait, first of all, I don't know anything about Christ. I'm Jewish. Let's right. start there. Okay. And uh, so is Christ, by the way. And so is Christ, which ultimately is the uh, real reality. <laughs> Anyhow, 
I so I got and then Ramdas came and I said Ramdas he said to meditate like Christ but I have no idea what going you talked to him and Maharaji then just when he was asked well how did Christ meditate by Ramdas he just tears came down his face and he became what that is whatever that is it was the same it was happening right in front of our eyes yeah. and he was lost and you don't understand he just kept saying over and over you do not understand you don't understand he was lost in love you don't understand right. he was one with every sentient being he died for all of us and that kind of a thing and we were like it i mean like lightning had struck mm -hmm. right but see you got M mother mary and which to me is so much more Sweet and benevolent, because mother, you, mother, you can no, do no wrong with mother, right? The famous prayer in in India for the mother that K. C. Tiwari taught us went something like, um, "I am completely uh, unable to meditate. I don't know how to chant. I don't know any of the prayers. I'm really a complete putz, basically. <laughs> but one thing I know is that." Mother would do nothing but support me, love me, give me compassion, and so on. Basically, translates like that. So, so you got that, but I got. How do I deal with meditating like Christ? Now I really see some of the wackiness that had to be uh, straightened out by Maharaji. Mr. Tiwari one time said to me that Hanuman lives at the boundary between form and formless. And, you know, I run the Living Dying Project. In fact, mm. for all you guys out there that don't know, www.livingdying.org, a lot mm. of good stuff. Yeah, a so lot of good stuff. Hanuman has one foot in form. He's serving people, but there's another foot in the formless. And finding that balance where you're you're loving humanity, you're serving, you're being there, but you're you're got this big huge window frame or this big huge picture frame, as as Ramdas put it. So you see the sky, you see the vastness, the boundlessness of the sky. That and so that all the human stuff is contextualized in that. That allows you to be Hanuman, to really be serving freely to be loving people, not because you need something or anything like that, but you see that it's all, it's all part of this infinite window frame, picture frame. And at the same time, you, you see that people are suffering, that people have needs, that I have needs, that you have needs. So that, that, that balance between like the, the formlessness of deep meditation and being in form and serving is the balance I keep trying to go back to. Yeah. And I can, I can do one or the other pretty darn good. And the question is, can I do both at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that goes back to Ramdas saying, we as humans absolutely can live on more than one plane of consciousness at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's the trick. What you just uh, said is the trick. It's a big trick for everybody. Yeah. And, and, you know, and trying not to project yourself into some obscure... Um, Eastern tradition is probably not the most efficacious thing one can do, but just I go back to this baby steps, just taking the baby steps because without the practice, none of this shit is going to be happening. I mean, no transformation is going to happen unless you got popped over the, you know, you can get popped over the head and something, you know, that can happen or you can lie in your bed like Ramana Maharishi Ramana Maharshi, and say, who am I, all night until you get the idea of who you are. I, I think uh, that's always possible. Who knows? That happened to him. But ultimately, it's a day-to-day -day thing of, of being human and being expansive, really, so that you're yep. not lost. Well, yeah, at one point, Ramdas said to me that I had the longest dark night of the soul of anybody he'd ever seen. And I was only just getting beginning on it. So uh, I've, I've been taking baby steps for a really, really long time. It's been, it's been really a slog. But at the same time, if, I mean, it, to me, it goes back to motivation and intention. What do you really want? Suzuki Roshi said, the most important thing is finding the most important thing. 
Mm. And if the most important thing is merging with God, then you don't care how many steps it takes, whether the big steps or little steps, you're always going in that direction. And even when it seems like you're not, you're going in that direction. Like that horrible quote of Ram Dass is that I hate to this day is that suffering is grace. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was true, but I didn't want to believe it. Right? Uh, yeah. yeah. And it's too facile to say to anyone in reality, in my mind, I used to say to him, I think this has got to be uh, qualified. Okay. Just like uh, the story you tell about, Maharaji saying, Ramdas, don't you see it's all perfect? Yeah, Maharaji can say that. You can't say it. I can. You know, we have to qualify that a little bit. Uh, uh, the reality of like karma and grace are one. You know, and that is just not something that any of us is uh, caught in duality can understand. There's no way. And and it's like you know that's again you know that's what I, my thing here will finish off with the advisists who say just be and it's all going to be cool and I'm like oh, all right well that's all true but if it's coming from a mind it is and an intellect it is just very difficult to integrate into one's uh, life and so now that we've gotten three, at least three different groups uh, completely offended. offended. Uh, who, who is that, the Buddhists and who else? Uh, well, uh, Swami Muktananda. Singh. Oh, yeah, that right, right. Yeah, that wasn't good. I could uh, tell stories about him that would, would get people really mad, but we won't do no, that. No, don't, don't be doing that. No, there's no necessity. I mean, beautiful things happen, yeah. and look how he served you. And me, he made, you know, I... He wouldn't let me sleep in the ashram. He said, go sleep across the street on the hill. I didn't realize that's where people went to poop. So talk about <laughs> getting, he helped get rid of some stuff as far as I'm concerned. You know, but my feeling is that every teacher has a purpose, whether it's Absolutely. Rajneesh or Muktananda yeah. or Joya or Maharaji, that, that if people are drawn to the Dharma in the, in the form that they need and, Jack Cornfield tells this wonderful story, if I can tell it really quickly, that he was with this monk in Asia where he, he was the translator at Achan Jumnian's temple. Achan Jumnian, when he was younger, was this completely beautiful, physically beautiful, radiant being. He looked like a living Buddha. And after a while, Jack noticed that these people who were coming out to this country monastery were there because they were in love with him, even the men. So he came to Achan Jumnian and said, hey... I mean, do you see that these people are coming here not for the Dharma, but because they're in love with you? And he said, well, of course I see that. But whatever brings people to the Dharma is fine. Once they sit down on the cushion, whether they're there because of me or because of something else, they're down on the cushion, and that'll take that, and it'll yeah. all take care of itself. Yeah. No, I'm so <laughs> Muktananda brought me to Maharaji in a certain mm -hmm. way, or Maharaji yeah. brought me to himself through Muktananda. So yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 it's certainly all good. And I, had and I didn't mean to offend anybody. We're just joking around here. Yeah. yeah. Don't, we can't be too self-serious with this stuff. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for hanging with me. My pleasure, all, as it. always. Yeah. So uh, Ramdev... Uh, and Dale Borglum will together, the two of them, we'll have link, we'll link them up so that you, you absolutely can take advantage uh, of the website and the work. And uh, you need to write a book. I keep saying that. I am writing. A, I, I've got a proposal with Shambhala and they're not getting back to me. Okay. Well, and I was talking to Ramesh a couple of days ago and he said, it was Shambhala doesn't come through he's got a connection for me it sounds true so it's in the oh, works there you go all right well uh but we but people you all can go and take advantage um uh, of the of ram deb and and his work and it'll all be linked up in the show notes and this is mind rolling on be here now network go to be here now network.com boy do we have some Wonderful talks by Ramdev and 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 myself, our host of friends from decades, from Sharon Salzberg to Jack Cornfield to Joseph Goldstein and Krishna Das and on and on and of course Ram Das. And do you know we have Alan Watts on the network now? I do know that. So wonderful, that's really wonderful too. So we're fortunate. We shall see you next time. Lots of love, Ram Ram. Ram Ram.